morning, church. Let's stand and worship. I was buried beneath my shame. Who could carry that kind of weight? It was my tomb till I met you. I was breathing. I was breathing, but not alive. All my failures I've tried to hide. It was my tomb till I met you. You call my name. Call my 
morning, everybody. Beautiful, cloudy day outside. the name above every other name Jesus the only one who could ever say worthy of every breath we could ever breathe we live for you we live for you holy
Father, we thank you for this day. Thank you that we're all here together to hear your message, to worship you, God. Thank you for all the blessings that we truly aren't worthy of everything that you do for us. No matter what we have going on in our lives, we can bring it to you, God. Where the deep 
distant past For a world of our sinners was slain So I cherish the old rugged cross Till my trophies at last I lay down I will cling to the old rugged cross And exchange it someday for a crown Oh, the old rugged cross Oh, the old rugged cross So despised by the world Has a wondrous attraction for me the dear Lamb of God left His glory above to bear it to dark Calvary. So I'll cherish, so I'll cherish the old rugged cross till the trophies at last I lay down. I will cling to the old rugged cross Change it someday for a crown. In the old rugged cross, in the old rugged cross, stained with blood so divine, a wondrous beauty I see. Towards all that old cross, Jesus suffered and died to pardon and sanctify me. So I'll cherish, so I'll cherish the old rugged cross till my trophies at last I lay down. I will cling to the old rugged cross. And exchange it someday for a crown So I'll cherish So I'll cherish the old rugged cross Till my trophies at last I lay down I will cling to the old rugged cross And exchange it someday for a crown I will cling to the old rugged cross and exchange it someday for a crown. Bow your heads with me, church. <clears throat> Dear Lord, I thank you for this place, Lord. I thank you for your cross, for your house, for your presence. We can just come and reset and be renewed, Lord. This world is so broken, and we see it when we're at the store, when we're out with friends, when we're at work, when we're at school. There are so many people that are hurting and misguided, and I just pray that you would help us to be that light. Give us the strength, Lord. Fill us up while we're here in your presence with your people to just go out and be your hands and feet into our community schools, work, and everywhere we go, Lord. We need you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, good morning, Celebration Church. I'm Ashley, and just when you thought I couldn't get any more corny, I wrote my announcements in a poem. So I am sorry for those of you that read actual poetry or write poetry. This might be offensive to you, but I'm going to give it a shot here. So... <laughs> You've heard this story so many times before, but grab a connect card and write down some more. It can be praises, your email, or prayer requests too. We love to hear from all of you, the old and the new. Announcing them to me seems like a chore, but when Pastor Dustin comes home, he will love a full card box back by the door. 
summer is for fun and connecting with friends, so sign up for camp before the summer ends. Miller Sylvania State Park is not too far away. From August 21st through the 25th, the teens will get to know God and each other in a whole new way. In the South Foyer, gra grab a paper packet and pen. Camp will change your life, so sign up and talk to our youth leader, Alan. <laughs> Speaking of youth, they're raising money next week, so stay after church and come take a peek. To pay for camp, they will wash your car and scrub off the dirt and the bugs and the tar. These kids are all great, and we want them to know, so get your car washed August 4th before you go. Tonight, skip some TV and come back here at 7. Let's do some free yoga because it feels like heaven. Everyone is welcome to stretch and hang out. Connecting with God, our bodies, and each other is what it's all about. Dana helps modify so it's never too hard, and if the weather is nice tonight, you may find us out in the yard. Okay, you've been listening to me struggle to rhyme, but just know that this church is great with their money and their time. There are four ways to give. If you look up on the screen, you help support our ministries because we're all a team. We do God's work here and far away, so thank you for your generosity today. Oh, <laughs> sorry. And Pastor Dustin's on vacation with his family in California. Um, so we have the pleasure and the honor of having Pastor Matt from Restoration Church um, and his family here with us today to share the word. Thank you so much, Ashley. And I don't know how to follow that, really, <laughs> honestly. So I'm, I'm not even going to try to, you know, live up to that. I will just be who I am and what I've prepared for today. But hey, thanks, everyone, for the welcome and... Um, Good morning and welcome to you as well. I want to welcome you into what um, God has prepared for you today, this word that he's put on my heart. I'm just, I'm honored to be able to share it with you. It's, it's one of these, as you'll see, it's a very personal word to me uh, that I feel like God has told me, this is one that you, you need to share with um, as many as you can. And uh, so I, I, I'm privileged today to be able to share that with you. I also just want to say I love the fact that we are a family. Um, you know, I'm from the Restoration Point. We're only 15 minutes away. We're part of the same fellowship of churches, Open Bible Churches. Um, but I just love that, you know, we pour into each other. That, you know, when I come here, I know I am part of your family, and I know you're part of my family in Christ. Um, we, you know, we've, we, we minister together. We share a lot of uh, the, the same, you know, kind of larger events together. We help each other out when we need it. And, and I just love the way that God has designed his body to work together that way. Uh, one of the ways that uh, I serve at my church is, is that I am a, our campus director for Discover Ministry School. But that's an awesome thing because when I think about Discover Ministry School, I think about Celebration Church. You guys are doing Discover as well. I actually got to talk to Theoden this morning who just got done wherever he was. There he is, right there, front row. Uh, I just got to talk to him. He just got done with Tier 1. But whenever you guys are doing Tier 1 in Discover Ministry School, we're doing Tier 2. And whenever we're doing Tier 1, you're doing Tier 2. Um, so there's always a year when you can jump in. You don't have to wait two years to jump into Discover. And uh, we've had folks from Celebration join us. We've got people with Restoration Point right now with you. And so I just love that this is, a, this is a journey we're on together. And so also, if anybody wants to talk about Discover after service, I'm happy to talk to you. Uh, we, we are starting a new year in Tier 1 at our church uh, in the fall, and you're invited. Um, so so thanks, for, th thanks for being family with us uh, today, and thanks for opening your heart to what God has to say. Let's go to him in prayer, and then we'll get to the word. Father God, thank you so much for your word and for being present here today. Lord, I believe you have just this valuable gift that you want to impart to us today. You have something to, to get into our hearts, something for us to take with us, something to transform us. Help us to receive, Lord. I know there are ways that we need to lay down some, some barriers that we have in order to receive. There are ways that we need to uh, open ourselves up to the invitation you have for us. And we need your help for those things. Even, even in saying yes to you, Lord, we need your grace in order to do that. So let us live in that grace today, Lord, where we might receive what you have for us. In Jesus' name, amen. 
Well, let me start by asking you a little bit of a loaded question. I love those. Uh, but here's the question. What is the best advice that you have ever received that you ended up ignoring anyway? Now, here's what I mean about this. I mean, like, someone gave you what you needed, right? They gave you maybe even something better than what you needed, but they gave you the truth. They gave you clarity. They gave you wisdom when there was no chance that you were going to see this on your own. They gave you something that was like absolute gold, and you ended up turning it down. Maybe you did it on purpose even. Uh, maybe it was laziness or pride, you know, something inside you that said, well, I know that's right, but I don't want it to be right. Um, or maybe you even turned it down on accident. You know, you forgot about it. You didn't write it down. Or you started taking that advice, but you got distracted, and you don't know where that went. You know, it just kind of disappeared. But it's a loaded question because I am just assuming here Every one of us has an answer to that question. I didn't ask you, you think this has ever happened to you? I just said, what is the best example of this ever happening to you? When you got this advice that you should have benefited so much from, it, this would have changed things so dramatically for you. This would have made such a huge difference for the good in your life, but you ended up not following it anyway. And I'm betting you've got an answer. Because if you're like me, I've got a lot of answers to that question. <laughs> Plenty of good advice that I have ignored. Some I'm probably still ignoring. And so the real tough part for me with that question is not, is it true, but just narrowing it down to one. And I know that's kind of, you know, not fun to say in front of a large audience, but hey, we're serving up truth here today in church. And I think that's true. But I'm also guessing that I'm not alone. If you've ever had parents, uh, if you've ever had good and wise friends or mentors in your life, if you've ever read a book that was designed to guide you into healthier choices, if you have ever listened to a sermon or read your Bible, I'm sure you too are the proud owner of some good, really important, ought to be following it advice that you are not at this moment indeed following. You may even have a sizable pile of it that's just kind of stacking up and you're wondering, am I ever going to get to all of that? But that's why I asked you to prioritize this morning, to sort through that pile and ask yourself, what's the biggest? What's the most important advice that someone has told you you should do that even though you agree with that now, you're still not doing it because some of that good advice you've received will get you a more organized sock drawer, but some of it will make you right with God. Some good advice you've received will save you a few bucks on your next trip to the grocery store, but some of it can save your marriage. Some good advice that you've received will help you find happiness for a few minutes, while other good advice will help you find joy for a lifetime. So perhaps the question isn't whether you'll get to it all, but whether you'll get to all of that advice, all of that instruction that really matters. Not that you'll complete this list, but that you'll be able to find out what really belongs on the top of that list, and that you'll be able to decide if it's on the top of that list, it does not get ignored. Now, today, I want to share a little bit of my own story with you as we look at God's Word together, because the passage of Scripture that we're going to look at today is what comes to mind when I ask myself this question. What's the best advice you've ever received, Matt, that you ended up ignoring anyway? We're going to look at this passage of Scripture that's always been there, that I knew about, that I had read or heard probably hundreds of times, that I agreed with, that has huge implications on life, but for many years, I ignored. I completely ignored it. But God did something in me. 
He changed me. He taught me and made me new in such a way that I just can't keep it to myself. It's not something I want to just say, this happened in me, and that's a great story for me. It's something I have to share with you. That's right, the same advice that I once ignored, the same wisdom, the same commands from Jesus, really, if we call them what they are, they have become the wisdom and commands that I have actively pursued, actively chosen to live by for decades ever since, and I never want to go back. They were never hiding. They were found smack dab in the middle of Jesus' most famous sermon. Shouldn't miss that. So let's read them now together. This is in the middle of the Sermon on the Mount. You've probably heard of it. The most famous sermon of all time. And after Jesus has just talked about this constant concern that humans have about how are things going to be all right with all the, the money and the financial pressures of life and having enough, he goes on to this in Matthew chapter 6, verses 25 verse 30, through 25 through 34. He says, therefore, I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothes? Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your, fatherly, your, your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Can any one of you, by worrying, add a single hour to your life? And why do you worry about clothes? See how the flowers of the field grow? They do not labor or spin, yet I tell you that not even Solomon in all of his splendor was dressed like one of these. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, will he not much more clothe you, <laughs> you of little faith? For the pagans run after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. And as I listen to this passage today, I just sense this heart that Jesus has for us. He wants us to be free, free from having to think that we've always got to be in control of what happens, free from obsessing about what may or may not happen in the future, free to be present instead of trapped in imaginary futures, free to trust in him, free to trust in someone who is, by the way, 100% trustworthy. That is the most freeing thing imaginable. That's like the very young child who just has this belief for some reason that their mom or their dad can handle anything. I mean, the sky could be falling in on the earth, but that young child's like, that's okay, my mom's here. She's got it. Like, that is the kind of freedom that Jesus wants for us, and he can provide it. There is just such beauty in that. But this freedom is offered to us. It is not forced upon us. It's an invitation, but it requires a response. There is a choice that we have to make over and over again if we will ever see this reality. And Jesus is clear about that. You know, he's not even ashamed to say it or even repeat it. In this passage we just read, Jesus gives the direct command, do not worry, three times in a row. And he tells us specifically what we are not to worry about. He says, don't worry about what you're going to eat, what you will drink, what you will wear. So like, don't worry about like the basic things of life that, you know, do matter. <laughs> don't worry about that. But yes, don't miss what else he says. He says, don't worry about tomorrow and don't worry about your life. 
Well, that doesn't leave a whole lot else on the table, does it? And that's exactly the point. This isn't Jesus just building this definitive list of here are five things to make sure you don't worry about those. No, he's basically saying, do not choose this. Do not choose to worry at all. It's pointless. It doesn't work. It fails to acknowledge who God is. And it's the opposite of trusting in God. And with those words, blam, Jesus has us all right in the chest. Because we may put on a, a confident face, but underneath the surface, you know, we do tend to worry about things like, you know, our lives. We are anxious about the uncertainties of our jobs and our relationships. We stress, about, stress out about money and all the obligations we have. And sometimes we just stress about how stressed we are. We're like, I don't know if I could take this anymore. And it is costing us dearly. It only takes a quick search on the internet to, to find out what our stress is doing to us. One study that found that stress has been proven to result in accidents, absenteeism, employee turnover, diminished productivity, and over $300 billion in direct medical, legal, and insurance costs per year just in our country. Other studies have shown how it is destroying us physically. It's linked to heart problems, cancer, shrinking brain mass, and lower IQ. Tooth and gum problems. I mean, like things you would never think about. Weakened immune systems, unstable emotions, weight gain, early aging, and more. I mean, worrying, anxiety, stressing out is some bad stuff. But it is some bad stuff that many of us live with every day of our lives. And sometimes we believe we have no choice that it is just the way life is. I mean, the world is stressful, right? The world is unfair. Everything is uncertain. And so worrying is just this natural byproduct of living on planet Earth. Congratulations, you're here. You will worry. It's not a good one, but what choice do we have? And yet other times, it's interesting because we'll go in the exact opposite direction and we will say, you know, yes, those same things are true. The world is stressful. The world is uncertain. The world is unfair. But worrying is the solution to that. And we will embrace it. If I could just obsess enough about all the possibilities that might happen, I might be able to find the right solution. If I could just build up enough savings and investments and properties, you know, I'll never have to worry about money again. Uh, you know, worry a little now so that you don't have to worry a lot later, right? Um, if I could just control the other people in my life, they won't be able to harm me. I mean, problems don't go away. Ignore them, right? So instead of, uh, of saying that worry is just something that traps us, we embrace it and we focus on the problems to that point where it becomes harming to ourselves and our own well-being and, oh, yeah, also to our relationship with God. We're not building trust in him. We're doing everything we can to have greater trust in ourselves. As I alluded to earlier, unfortunately, I know this dynamic all too well because everything I just described back in my college years, that used to describe me to a T. It described me perfectly. Sometimes I was the one who felt trapped by worries, like I didn't have a choice, like I couldn't control the way that my own mind would obsess about my life. But other times I was the other one. I was the one to embrace it. I was like, okay, all right, let's use this, right? I was smart. I was uh, the guy who thought about the details. I was good about thinking about things. And so I said, I was going to obsess about any and all of my problems until, well, until things weren't a problem anymore or until I 
learned that maybe I didn't need to obsess about them anyway, which many of them went that way. Um, but if worrying paid money, I could have been a professional. Um, I could have, I, I mean, I worried about everything. I worried about school, classes, assignments, grades, deadlines. I worried about relationships, making wise decisions that could have lifelong impacts, being accepted, being truly understood by others. I worried about life plans. I was going to go into the Air Force. I had this calling in my life to ministry. And how was I going to make those things work together? I worried about money. I worried about time. I worried about tomorrow. I worried about life, all the things Jesus said, don't. <laughs> now, I was a Christian in college. I've been following Christ by my own decision since I was very, very young. I was going to a Christian university. I was a very active member of my church. My faith was real. My relationship with Jesus was solid. This wasn't a, crush, a question of like, you know, this is something that non-Christians would have to worry about, but not us Christians. No, I had this real relationship with Jesus Christ, but yet I was solidly in disobedience to this instruction. Three times Jesus says it, do not worry, do not worry, do not worry. Wow, did I blow it. But God did something in my life that I'll never forget. I don't know how he did it. <laughs> and I don't even know exactly when he did it. But he did it, uh, and I don't use this word lightly. He miraculously freed me from being chained to worry. Sometime in my junior year, God changed me on this issue 100%. I didn't go to some special revival. I didn't uh, remember saying any sort of specifically, you know, carefully worded prayer that was supposed to do the trick. And so I don't really remember exactly a single moment when it happened. I have a guess, and I'll tell you about that a little bit later. But, but I do know through and through that God changed me because I know who I was. And I know the sleep I lost. I know what, the way my own mind would torture me about stuff that would probably ever need, never even need such concern. And I know who I became. And today... I can tell you, not stressing out, even during a real crisis, I consider that to be one of my strengths. Today, I have a great freedom in my heart about the future, even when that future may be very much up in the air in reality. Today, I could tell you a story about nearly four years that God walked me through that should have been the most stressful time of my life, four years when I was the sole provider for a family of four, and did not have a permanent job for four full years. I moved from a temporary job to a temporary job to a temporary job over and over again for four years. And I could tell you I truly did not stress out over this time, but I just learned to trust God in new ways and in new, in new circumstances. And I consider that time to be a blessing and a time when God was working in a powerful way in my life. It made my confidence in God's provision only grow. This change in me has been like night and day, and it's stuck with me now for over two decades. It's not a flash in the pan. It's been a work of God, not of my own doing. And if you ever ask me a good reason to believe in miracles, I will tell you I know I've got at least this life-changing miracle that God has done in my life. And as much as that's a great testimony, and it shows that we serve a great and powerful God. It doesn't provide instruction to you, though, because the message today is not, I found my miracle, now you go find yours, because I can't promise you that, that is how God is going to work in you. God is certainly the God of miracles, but he does them when and where and how he chooses, and we can't control or predict those either <laughs> unless God somehow reveals how he's going to do things to us, then we'd have a better clue. But as I've reflected on the change that God has made in my life that he has brought about over the years, he's also shown me that what he did in me was not just some unexpected healing, just some unexplained thing that happened that I have no answers for. 
He's shown me that he's done a lot more than that. He's changed what I believed. He's changed how I think. He changed how I trust him. You know, I've just recently determined that so one of my favorite verses in the Bible is Romans chapter 12, verse 2. It says this. It says, do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. And the reason I love this verse so much is that it clearly lays out this challenge. You want God to transform you? You want that big, dare I say, miraculous change to happen inside of you? Well, then let God change your mind first. Let him change how you think. Let him change how you perceive things. Let him change what you value. Then you'll see things from his perspective. And he can do so much from that point on. And as I've looked back at the change God did in me, I can see not just that he granted me relief at some point from this spiral of negative thoughts that I used to live in every day, but I can see how he changed how I think about him, who he is, what he's about, and what he really wants for me. In fact, I'm pretty sure that he was doing this work long before I knew that he had a release of freedom to give me in my life. So in the time we have remaining, I want to share with you two shifts in thinking that God worked in me as he freed me from worry. And like his instruction not to worry, neither of these things is new. They have also been in the scriptures this whole time. I had heard them. I had agreed with them in principle. But I know that I know that I know that once I really embraced them, these two shifts in thinking were and still are critical to freeing me from worry. And I believe they can be for you as well. So the first one is this. God wants you to redefine success. God wants you to redefine success. Merriam-Webster's dictionary will tell you success is this a favorable or desired outcome. Also, the attainment of wealth, favor, or eminence. And, you know, that's a pretty decent description of what we're used to. Success is, you know, when things work. Success is winning. Success is achieving the goal that you started out to achieve or perhaps accidentally achieving something good that you didn't intend to achieve. Whatever it is, though, it's always this good outcome. Right? Success in business is making money. Success in school, good grades. Success in bowling, somebody invented it, but you know, there's this plastic ball, there's 10 wooden pins, and you knock them all down. But it's still always about what happens as a result. The world defines success as a favorable outcome. You try to do something, something good happens as a result, it's a success. If something bad happens as a result, well, that's a failure. It's all about measuring the outcomes. But here is the big problem with that. No one can guarantee a favorable outcome. In business, you could do everything right to launch this great new product and still fail. I mean, you can have the right ideas. You can have the right talent working on those ideas. You can have a good business plan, a great marketing and distribution plan. And then the economy can take a dive at just the wrong moment. 50% of your investors pull out. Now you don't have the money to do it. Your product launch never even goes out and you will fail. You did everything right and your business failed. Hmm. Well, in a relationship, you could be the most loving, compassionate, selfless, caring person ever. But the other person could still decide to be a jerk and your relationship will fail. As parents, you can do everything under the sun to give your kids the best chance in the world to live the way 
that God wants them to live. You can raise your kids right. You can teach them about God. You can teach them all the life skills that they'll need as an adult. But when they grow up, they can still go off and act like they never learned a thing from you. Even Jesus would tell you this is true. The Son of God himself would pour three years of his life into 12 men named his disciples. But one of them would still betray him and end up committing suicide. That was not a favorable outcome. But would we say that Jesus failed with Judas? It's no wonder we worry. It's not hard to see why we stress out. Favorable outcomes don't just come automatically. They take planning. They take hard work. They take risk. They take investing. They take putting ourselves on the line. And then even after all of that, we still might not achieve what we were hoping for. But here is a life-changing truth. God wants us to redefine success because for God... Success is about obedience, not outcomes. Success is about obedience, not outcomes. Or we could phrase it another way and say, here's how God's word would define success. Success is obedience to God's commands and his plans for your life. It's not about what happens after we obey. It is about whether or not we obey, period. Let me show you a couple of scriptures where Jesus talks about this. First off is John chapter 14, verses 23 and 24. This is the night before Jesus goes to the cross, and he just lays out, here are some of the most important things my disciples need to understand. Here's one of them. He says, anyone who loves me will obey my teaching. My Father will love them. We will come to them, and we will make our home with them. Anyone who does not love me will not obey my teaching. These words you hear are not my own. They belong to the Father who sent me. What is God looking for? Obedience, period. doesn't say anything here about outcomes. Anyone who loves me will successfully lead the following people to know me, or anyone who loves me will have great relationships with everyone in their family, or anyone who loves me will achieve great status in society, or anything like that. There's no measurable, favorable outcome here at all, just the call to obey. In another passage of Scripture, Jesus addresses this even more directly. Luke chapter 7, verses 21 to 23 In that passage, he teaches this. He says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name drive out demons and in your name perform many miracles? Then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, you evildoers. Look at this passage. Jesus is saying, many people are going to protest to me. They're going to come to me and they're going to say, we succeeded for you. We called you Lord. We brought about favorable outcome after favorable outcome. We did miracles for you. We drove out demons for you. How many people can say this? But Jesus' response to them is, but you didn't obey me. I don't care about your favorable outcomes. I care if you do the will of my Father. If we had time, I would have you look deep into some chapters of Scripture where you see this is God laying out, here's what I expect, here's what I want to see from you, and you will see it is not about favorable outcomes. I would take you to Isaiah chapter 6, this great story where the prophet Isaiah, famous prophet in the Old Testament, gets this call to ministry, and God basically tells him, here's your job. 
you're going to go out and speak my words to the people of Israel. Until what? Until everyone turns their back on you and on me and the whole nation is destroyed. Wow. (laughs) Or I would take you to Philippians chapter 2 where it sums up the life of Jesus and it says he was obedient to death even death on a cross. That's not a favorable outcome. But it says, and therefore, therefore, because of that obedience, he was exalted to the highest place and given a name above all names. And the Bible is full of examples such as these where God shows us over and over again that success is obedience, not being vindicated at your trial. Success is obedience, not having thousands of people turn from their wicked ways because of your preaching. Success is obedience, not escaping hardship, not achieving greatness, not being liked or even at peace with others, not making money, not losing the weight, not receiving that miracle, not having everything work out. Success is simply obedience to God's commands and his plans for your life. And if we can get that truth, not just in our heads, but down into our hearts, it will kill a whole lot of worry. Why? Because get this, because God has given us the option to succeed in every endeavor that matters in life. We get the freedom. We get this huge freedom to stop obsessing about what's going to happen because we succeed or fail before that based on our choice to obey, not based on outcomes. So at work, If we are obedient to the Lord in how we apply ourselves to our work and how we treat the people we work with, and if we are obedient with the income that that generates, we've already succeeded. It doesn't matter if we get promoted, if we get that raise, if we get that new position, or if we get fired at home, if we obey God's plan for our relationships if we develop godly character in ourselves and sacrificial love and mutual submission and respect for those in our family as God has commanded us to, we have already succeeded. It doesn't matter if an unbelieving spouse either turns to Jesus or decides that they're going to leave the family on their own choice. See, we can succeed in any task and in any place that God has us in life because our success or our failure does not depend on what happens. It does not depend on the success the way the dictionary defines it. It just depends on our choice to obey. And if we'll remember back to Jesus' teaching on worry, he gives us right there the alternative. He says, don't worry, instead Seek first, seek above all else God's kingdom and God's righteousness. Look, that is just fancy ways of saying, put God in charge, right? That's what the kingdom of God means. It's where he is king, where he is in charge. Put God in charge and obey him. Live by his instructions on what is right or righteous. Don't worry, but Put God in charge and obey him. This is true success. And I promise you that if you will let that truth be more than just an academic fact to you, easy to agree to, hard to live by, but if you will let that be more than just a fact in your brain, if you will let it shape how you see your presence and how you see your future, how you plan and how you evaluate, it will absolutely change your life. The second shift in thinking that I really want to share with you is this. God always has a perfectly matched goodness and strength for you. 
in the midst of every hardship. Now, our normal thinking is something a little more like this. God's perfect goodness and strength are awesome. I know I'm going to see them when he gets me out of this hardship. And, you know, it's like we, we admit, right, like we know God is good. And, you know, I expect God to show that goodness in one very particular way. And that is by, I will know God is good by him removing hardships from my life. But this is exactly the shift that I am hoping that you will trust him enough to make, that you and I will actually believe his word when he tells us, when he promises us that God always has a perfectly matched goodness and strength for you in the midst of every hardship. I mentioned to you earlier that I don't know exactly when uh, God finished delivering me from worry. But I know it was pretty close to a moment when I heard a sermon on this specific truth about 25 years ago. You ever have one of those moments? Like, I mean, if I'm honest, like, it is hard to remember maybe a sermon that I heard even a month ago sometimes. And if that's you as well, I want to say that's okay. God works in us little by little. We we don't always, uh, you know, have perfect recall of everything even as he's doing heart work on us over time. But there's certainly been a few moments in my life where God has spoken to me so clearly, so powerfully, so deeply. It's like I couldn't forget those moments if I tried, and this was one of those. For the rest of the church that morning, it was probably just a pretty regular Sunday morning. I mean, okay, it was a little bit different because uh, we came into church that morning. We found out we'd have a guest speaker, which, you know, good things to still happen, right, when somebody's doing that. But we, we found out we'd have a guest speaker. But other than that, uh, we, um, we, we would have thought that this was just a normal Sunday. Well, for in me, though, like this was a, a normal-ish type of Sunday as well, which was not a good thing. Which Normal for me in the time was meaning that I was worrying because worrying was normal for me back then as well. But on this particular day, it was a little beyond that, I have to admit. It was a little more intense because on this particular day, I was worried about my relationship with an absolutely beautiful woman named Olivia Martin. She's here today, but she has a different name. She was my girlfriend at this time. Um, And we had a great relationship. We both believed that God was leading us toward marriage. And this was the day that I was going to talk to her parents about that. Now, that would have already been enough to make me a nervous wreck, right? Uh, But get this. On top of that, I already had some advanced knowledge about this. Olivia had had prior conversations with her parents. We were in this together. But I already had prior knowledge that her parents were against the matter. Yeah. So that was awesome. That was an awesome place to be. But I was still planning on being that guy who did the traditional respectful thing of asking for their blessing before I proposed to Olivia. And that was what was going on in my mind that day, torturing my mind. That what was, was what was squeezing my chest that morning. That was messing up my stomach that morning. I was a wreck walking into church already. And the guest speaker got up, and he gave a simple message on 2 Corinthians chapter 12. This is the passage of Scripture where the Apostle Paul mentions he's going through something of an ongoing struggle, but he mentions how God has met him so personally in the midst of it. So let's look at that Scripture. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, we'll start with the second half of verse 7. Paul says this, in order to keep me from being conceited, I was given a thorn in my flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me. Three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. 
My grace is sufficient. It is fully enough for you. For my power is made perfect in your weakness. These are words I had heard, words I had read many, many times before, but the speaker's point was about how personally God meets us in matching our needs with his grace. I remember he described it as this precision cut grace. He even even made this motion with his hands and said, it's like God is cutting this out just for your circumstance, just for your life, just for what you need, just for this moment, just for today. God has a precision cut grace for you and your circumstance. It wasn't this one size fits all. It was God caring about each person's individual circumstance with our own unique hurts, our own unique history, our needs, our hardships, and God saying, I can give you exactly what you will need to find strength in me. The Apostle Paul, think about it. The Apostle Paul didn't have any trouble realizing who God was. The Apostle Paul would be the first people to stand up and tell you God is great and mighty and loving and compassionate and merciful and that God can handle anything. But what Paul needed to hear God say was not this. Paul, I've got this. You know my strength is big enough for anything. What Paul needed to hear God say was, Paul, I have grace and strength and power for you in particular, right where you're at. And in that scripture, if you were to look at the the original text in Greek, you would realize that you is not, I have grace for you, it's I have grace for you in particular. And that word you is written in such a way in Greek that it is emphasized even. It is, I want you, Paul, you to know this. I have grace for you in this situation. God has something specific and personal for you right where you're at, just what you need for the life you actually have. And if it's not going the way you wish it was, even better. Because God says his power is made perfect in your weak places. Fully effective in just such places as those. And that was the exact kind of grace that this particular young college student who was stressed out about doing the right thing with family and with marriage and worried about being accepted and stressed out about how things could ever be right. That was the kind of grace I needed that morning. It was the best message I could have possibly heard on that day. And it marked one of the last moments in my life that I could tell you I was a pretty anxious person. I'm going to invite the worship team to come back up as we're getting ready to close. But the first truth we talked about this morning that could completely change your life was that God wants you to redefine success. And the second is this. God always has a perfectly matched goodness and strength for you in the midst of every hardship. Or you could say God always has a grace for you that is an exact fit for your particular circumstances. Oh, if we will put these two things together, we would know what to do in any hard time. We wouldn't need to worry about how things will turn out. You know, you only need to worry about how things will turn out if you're the one in charge. But if we will let God change how we think, if we will really break away from some of these patterns that come so naturally, some of these things that are just how everyone does it, 
we will stop measuring success by how things turn out. Instead, we will succeed by simply putting God in charge and obeying. We will succeed by just following Jesus, no matter what outcomes that may produce. But in that obedience, there is more that we will receive than just this wonderful knowledge that we've made the right choice. It's not just that, because God will meet us there. He will meet us exactly in that place that we are going through with his perfect grace, this unmerited favor, favor combined with his perfect power working together in our life. This is what he wants to deliver us in that moment. And we have the opportunity to receive God's best. Can't even imagine how good that is. But we'll get his perfect power when we walk with him in our weakness. This is his invitation to us each day. And the invitation is open. Let's pray. Father God, it is, it's amazing to me that no matter where we are on this journey of faith, that it just all keeps coming back to trusting you. That we can find ourselves locked in a prison of worry, God, in a prison of our own making because we're still trying to be in control. We're still trying to call the shots. We're still trying to make sure we are okay. We're trying to do that. God, and I just hear you saying, son, that is not your job. Daughter, that is not your job. God, you are inviting us to trust you with all of that, with our needs, with our lives, and with every uncertainty that tomorrow holds. You are inviting us to trust you, the only one in history who has always been trustworthy. There is such freedom in that, Lord. And yet so many times we would rather trust ourselves. Transform us, Lord. Change us from the inside out. Renew our minds, Lord. Help us to shift our thinking towards the truth that you've always been calling us to. And help each one here today to act on what they've received. That we may walk in freedom from worry. In Jesus' name, we thank you, we love you, and we pray these things.
the God of the mountain, is the God of the valley, and there's not a place your mercy and grace won't find me again. Oh, there's not. Thank you guys so much for coming. I hope you all have an amazing Sunday.